by the way we live and love every day. And we do that because this grace is greater than all our sin. <clears throat>
that the Lord should be our God. This began in 1755, where he spent several teaching times explaining what it meant to make a promise like this to the Lord, and how they would need his wisdom and strength to keep it, just the same as us. The night they met to sign the commitment, 1,800 people stood, determined to carry this out. So we've got the space all filled with angels. It is important that we recognize our continuing need for confession. We have tended to connect confession only to the moment of turning to Christ for the first time. Our shortcomings and human failings need the atoning blood of Christ as well as our properly so-called <coughs> sins. According to the Apostle Paul, each of us must live daily recognizing our need of the cleansing work of Christ. Jesus invited us into this covenant relationship with God. Nowhere is that more evident than when Jesus invites us to pray the prayer we have come to call the Lord's Prayer or the Disciples' Prayer taught by our Lord. It is a community prayer. We pray to our Father, recognizing that he has drawn us to himself as a people. It expresses our desire together to see God's kingdom revealed among us. And so would you join me in praying this, and it might throw you off, but we're going to pray, forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. In John 15, Jesus says this, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. My dear friends, fix these three principles in your hearts. Things eternal are more endearing, during, and real. Well, they're endearing, too. And real than things temporal. Things not seen are as certain, more certain, as the things that are, are seen. Second Corinthians says, so we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. And your present choice depends your eternal destiny, or determines your eternal destiny. Choose Christ and his ways, and you are blessed forever. Refuse him, and you are forever undone. And then, my friends, make your choice. Turn either to the right hand 
or to the left. Christ with his yoke, his cross, and his crown. Or the devil with his maybe wealth, his maybe pleasure, and his definite curse. Then ask yourself, self, you see what is before you. What will you do? Which will you have? Either the crown or the curse. If you choose the crown, remember that that day you take this, you must be content to submit to the cross and the yoke, the service and sufferings of Christ which are linked to it. What do you say? Would you rather take the grains and pleasure, gains and pleasures of sin and risk the curse? Or will you yield yourself as a servant to Christ and so make sure the crown? John 3 says, anyone who believes in God's Son has eternal life. Anyone who doesn't obey the Son will never experience eternal life, but remains under God's wrath. God's judgment. Do not delay the matter. If you are unresolved, then you are resolved. If you remain undetermined for Christ, you are determined for the devil. Therefore, follow your hearts from day to day. Do not rest until this matter is settled once and for all. And see to it that you make the good choice. Next, begin your journey with Christ. Adventure with him. Cast yourselves upon his righteousness. You are exiles from the presence of God and fallen into a land of robbers and murderers. Your sins are robbers. Your pleasures are robbers. Your companions in sin are robbers and thieves. If you stay where you are, you perish. Christ offers, if you will venture with him, to bring you to God. Hebrews 11 says, Faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot see. So will you say now to him, Lord Jesus, will you take me? Will you bring me to God and bring me into the land of promise? With you I will risk myself. I cast myself upon you, upon your blood, upon your righteousness. Titus 3 says this, He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. In 1 Timothy we read, I have fought a good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. We are coming to Christ as our priest. Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. And by this you now renounce your own righteousness. You deeply sense your need of God's grace in Christ, whether we are already forgiven sinners or still far from God, let us confess together our total dependence on Him. Because He is able also to save completely those who draw near to God through Him, since He always lives to intercede for them. During this service, there will be readings that come up that I'm asking you to join me in in each reading. I will let you read first in your head, and then we will read it together.
we acknowledge a deep sense of our need. We see ourselves as sinners in need of a Savior. The Spirit of God has awakened us, for we have cried out, Lord, where am I? Is there no hope of escaping from this wretched state? I am but dead if I continue as I am. What can I do to be saved? Being made aware of his sin and his danger, a sinner will look for help and deliverance. But he will look everywhere else before he looks unto Christ. Nothing will bring a sinner to Christ but absolute necessity. He will try to forsake his sins. He will go to prayers and sermons and sacraments and search out if there is salvation in them. But all these, though they be useful in their places, are of no help. His duties cannot help him. These may be numbered among his sins. Ordinances cannot help. These are but empty cisterns. They all tell him, you knock at a wrong door. Salvation is not in us. You now utterly despair of your own goodness? Or do you trust anything but Christ? Lord, be merciful to me. What shall I do? I dare not remain as I am, and I cannot help myself. My praying will not help me. My hearing will not help me. If I give all my goods to the poor, if I should give my body to be burned, all this would not save my soul. Woe is me. What shall I do? You must let your sins go. You must let your righteousness go. Christ came not to call the, sin, the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He came to seek and to save those that are lost. Will you now risk yourselves for Christ? You have this threefold assurance. First, we have God's initiative. He took the first move. God the Father has appointed and sent Christ into the world to save sinners. Jesus Christ is the one whom God the Father has made our Savior. He is redeeming and reconciling the world to himself. Second, we have God's command. This is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ. Third, we have God's promise. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and whoever believes on him shall not be disappointed. Now, because we have this threefold assurance of God's initiative, command, and promise, we may now be bold to risk everything for Christ and to make ourselves totally available to him. I will let you read it again. That's quite a few slides. We'll do it a slide at a time. Lord Jesus, here I am, a lost creature, an enemy to God, under his wrath and curse. Will you, Lord, take me as I am, reconcile me to God, and save my soul? Do not refuse me, Lord, for if you refuse me, to whom then shall I go? If I had come in my own name, you might well have ignored me. But since I come at the command of the Father, do not reject me. Lord, help me. Lord, save me. I come, Lord. I believe, Lord.
I throw myself upon your grace and mercy. I trust your saving death alone to save me. Do not refuse me. I have nowhere else to go. Here I will stay. I will trust you and rest in you and risk myself before you. On you I lay my hope for pardon, for life, for salvation. If I perish, I perish on your shoulders. If I sink, I sink in your ship. If I die, I die at your door. Do not bid me to go away, for I will not go. Commit yourselves to Christ as his servants. Give yourselves to him that you may belong to him. Christ has many services to be done. Some are more easy and honorable. Others are more difficult and disgraceful. Some are suitable to our inclinations and interests. Others are contrary to both. In some, we may please Christ and please ourselves. But then there are other works where we cannot please Christ except by denying ourselves. It is necessary, therefore, that we consider what it means to be a servant of Christ. Let us, therefore, go to Christ and pray. Let me be your servant. Under your command, I will no longer be my own. I will give my, up myself to your will in all things. Be satisfied that Christ shall give you your place and work. Think carefully before you make this. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not have anything you serve or worship other than me. You shall not use the name of God in curses or casual conversation. Work six days and do everything you need to do. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to God. 
He set it apart as a holy day for you to rest in him. Honor your father and mother so that you'll live a long time. Do not murder or commit adultery or steal or tell lies. Do not set your heart on anything that belongs to your neighbor. After having carefully considered them, are you willing to choose them all? Next, inspect the growth of the fruit of the Spirit in your life. Do you have greater joy now than this time last year? Does your peace surpass that of unbelievers? Are you more patient with your spouse, your children, your neighbors, your co-workers, and other members of the body of Christ than you were a year ago? What acts of kindness have you shown in the last week? When faced with a choice of two actions, do you choose the one that most honors Christ and blesses others, or do you choose in your own self-interest first? Have you faithfully kept your commitments to your marriage, your family, your church, your employer, to God in the past year? Have you dealt gently with those who are under your authority and care? Have you shown respect to those with whom you have disagreed? Have you been compassionate to the weak, the disabled, the poor, and the defenseless? Have you been temperate in your eating and drinking? Have you been careful in your conversations and language? Have you balanced work and rest? Be sure that you are clear in these matters. See that you do not lie to God. Second, be serious and in a spirit of holy awe and reverence. Third, claim God's covenant. Rely on God's promise of giving grace and strength so you can keep your promise. Trust not your own strength and power. And resolve to be faithful. You have given to the Lord your heart. You have opened your mouth to the Lord and you have dedicated yourself to God. With God's power, never go back. And finally, be prepared to renew your covenant with the Lord. Open your hearts then to the Lord in song and in prayer. All to Jesus I
O righteous God, for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, forgive my unfaithfulness in not having done your will. For you have promised mercy to me if I turn to you with my whole heart. I do here covenant with you, O Christ, to take my lot with you as it may fall. Through your grace I promise that neither life nor death shall part me from you. I make this covenant with you, O God, without guile or reservation. If any falsehood should be in it, guide me and help me to set it aright. And now, O oh glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are mine, and I am yours. So be it. Let this covenant I have made on earth be ratified in heaven. Amen. Before we sing our last song, we do have a group signature page up here and individual ones that you can take home. The pens and the glass are clean. When you use one, put it on the table. You may use the same pen if you're a couple. Otherwise, don't pick up a pen off the table, please. Um, actually, we're just going to take a few minutes of quiet and let you sign the signature page now. Take my life and let it be
Amen.